I'm very pleased to say that Amin Nasser, the CEO of Saudi Aramco, joins us here in New York. Amin, it's great to have you with us. I guess my first question for you is, speaking to investors on a daily basis, I don't see the huge appetite for big oil right now. And as you look around the world, Saudi Arabia themselves diversifying away from oil for the future, Norway trying to cut oil risk as well. Yet you personally seem to be very bullish on the future of crude. And I want to try and understand what underpins that bullishness. Well, if you look at the numbers and uh, on the ground today, there is very healthy demand for, for oil. Uh, if you look at the last three years, the uh, demand growth is about 1.5 to 1.7 million barrels per day. So over three years, there is a growth of about 5 million barrels per day. The economy is doing, uh, global economy is doing very well, and there is a demand for more oil. So uh, for uh, the global energy security, we need to make sure that we have enough resources uh, by not only by Saudi Arabia, by other uh, companies and countries uh, uh, to make sure that we have enough supply to meet uh, rising demand. But when you look at, say, the future of the internal combustion engine, I don't see the money at car manufacturers going into R&D for the internal combustion engine. But listening to you speak recently, you seem to be quite optimistic about the future of something that a lot of people aren't optimistic about. Why? Actually, uh, you would have seen that there is a much better uh, improvement in reducing carbon emission from efficiency in uh, combustion engine by increasing the efficiency than from renewable. A lot of uh, reduction in carbon emission happened because of the rising efficiency. There is a lot of work is going on right now to improve the efficiency in terms of mileage per gallon. And, and uh, Aramco, Saudi Aramco, is also doing a lot of work to improve the efficiency of engines through our Detroit center here in the U.S., our center in, in Paris, working with the auto manufacturer to improve the efficiency of engines, creating better fuel formulations that will have less emissions. So there's a lot of work done by companies, uh, oil and gas companies, to improve efficiency and reduce the emissions and done by auto manufacturer to improve also the efficiency. Yeah. You'll understand that for a lot of people this is part of a broader concern around the IPO of Saudi Aramco. There's been reports that the investor appetite just isn't there in the way that the Saudis would like. Do you see the investor appetite? Oh, of course. Where uh, is it? I think there is a lot of investor appetite. That's why all, a lot of the questions and the uh, uh, media coverage and what you see in the news is about the IBO and when, when it will happen. Uh, there is a lot of, uh, uh, I think, demand for uh, the listing of Saudi Aramco. Uh, Aramco in terms of performance and uh, the data will show when we go on our roadshow ultimately that how uh, our performance and how uh, we are the highest producer, the most efficient, the most reliable. So uh, uh, this is a great company that the data hopefully later on will show our performance. But when I speak to people, they're not talking about when this will happen. They're now talking about if this will happen, that perhaps the whole IPO just goes into the deep freeze and doesn't happen at all. Well, there's a lot of uh, work that is still ongoing. Uh, the company, uh, the government, uh, did all the paperwork to make it a joint stock company effective January 2018. That's an indication that the IBO is uh, ongoing. Uh, the preparation uh, by Saudi Aramco never stopped. Uh, we should be, as we always said, ready uh, as a company for listing in the second half of 2018. So we are doing a lot of work to prepare there are the company for listing. At the same time, there are committees from the government that overlook what we are doing and the preparedness that we are doing to make sure the company is ready for listing. Do you have a set of accounts audited to UK and US standards already? Is that done? For the reserves you're talking about? For the whole company itself? No. The only requirement for listing is, uh, in terms of auditing, is the reserves. And whatever required by the listing venues, we will be availing all the necessary documents. So it's not your decision ultimately when this will happen? No. The, but I'm the, trying to understand when yeah, this will happen. The, the, the venue and the timing is the government uh, will decide on that. And don't forget, this is a very uh, complex process, uh, the Aramco size and 
complexities, uh, something that require time for review. There are a lot of venues to listen other than the kingdom for sure. So uh, there is a lot of work that is ongoing to evaluate all of that and decide on the timing for and the venue. As you go through this process, what have you learned about the company that you didn't know? And I guess for many people, what has changed in the, let's say, year and a half that you've had to prepare the company for IPO? What has changed with Saudi Aramco? Is the company any different? Well, we have always, you know, for others that know us very well, always worked like an international oil company. The way we do our business, the way we conduct our reviews, our balance sheets, financial statements, and all of that. Like any international oil company, we benchmark with others in the various categories from cost to environment to safety to technology. So all of these things we do like others. Uh, I think what we are excited about the listing for one reason is that uh, it will bring a lot of visibility to our performance. We will be able to share the data that we know that our shareholder is aware of in terms of benchmark, as I said, in all the categories I highlighted earlier. So uh, I think it brings a lot of excitement. We have uh, good performance, good data. We are not only the lowest cost, the highest reliability. And uh, even if you look at uh, carbon footprint for each barrel we produce, we have yeah. the lowest intensity, uh, as you know, highlighted in the latest article on the energy nature. That shows you know, the crude, different crudes uh, being uh, sent or uh, imported by China. Uh, Saudi crude have the lowest uh, carbon intensity, and that's a reflection not only of the quality of the reservoirs that we have, also uh, the technologies, the reservoir management, the standards applied to produce uh, the crude. You understand there's a narrative around Saudi Aramco that because it's a state-owned oil producer, it must be a wasteful company, that you don't have the cost discipline of, say, Exxon, Shell, BP. Are you saying otherwise that the story is not what it seems to a lot of people? Well, you know, I think the story and the data and the numbers will be shared. When uh, the, the listing happened, we have a roadshow. We have a prospectus that's being prepared. And the roadshow, we will share all of the data. The investors will be asking for all of the data you mentioned. Do you think they'll be surprised? Uh, let me say that I'm sure they, I mean, no, based on what we hear in the news about the numbers, how much it costs us and all of that, uh, we think we are doing much better than what is on the news. We, ha we know our performance. We have the facts. We will share it. There is no wasteful of anything. Actually, uh, they will find out this is a well-run company in terms of, as I said, not only in cost, on safety and in environment and in technology. Because some people would have a look at your production numbers and compare it to the capex spend and decide that maybe the capex spend is quite a lot considering this is meant to be a cheap barrel of oil. Can you explain that, try and reconcile the two things? Well, our cam capital need to be compared to other companies in terms of also our size. We are a 12 million barrel. Uh, our maximum sustained capacity is 12 million barrels. We produce in raw gas, our capacity in raw gas, about 15.5 uh, billion standard cubic feet per day. We have huge uh, program in petrochemicals with a lot of investment in, with, uh, in the kingdom and out of kingdom. We have a lot of JVs. Our refining, participated refining capacity today is 5 million barrels per day. So, uh, and we are uh, in a growth uh, mood. Basically, we are, if you look at our gas, we are looking at doubling our gas compared to 2015 numbers reaching almost 23 billion static cubic feet per day of uh, gas capacity. If you look at our refining capacity, we're looking at going to 8 to 10 million barrels per day. Petrochemical, we're looking at two to three-folds expansions in our petrochemical sector. So this is a company all about also growth opportunities in the right sectors. So if you look at our capitals, you should not compare it to other companies that have producing 2 million or 3 million barrels per day. You need to put into account what is our capacity. Yeah. This is the 12 million barrels, 15.5 billion. We have almost uh, a huge uh, uh, petrochemical capacity uh, globally right now, especially with our Sadara, with Dow Petrochemical completed, uh, and our joint venture second phase with uh, Somotomo and Betul also uh, 
on uh, production. So huge capacity, and we do have huge investment, as I said, in different sectors. You recognize you will be benchmarked in terms of your return profile oh, to other companies. Of course. <laughs> you said you'll be competitive. Of course. Shell, as far as I know, haven't cut their dividends since World War II, and the dividend yield right now is about 6%. Yeah. Can you be competitive with that? Well, you know, uh, we will be, uh, as I said, in terms of uh, uh, dividend and in terms of uh, rate of return, I think uh, that all will be shared uh, up front in terms of uh, with the investors when we in, go on our roadshow. Uh, and uh, the performance of the company, as I said, in terms of uh, the cost per barrel, how much it costs us to produce the barrel, how much it costs us to produce the 1 million BTU of gas. Uh, as I said, it is the lowest in the industry. Can we be competitive with Shell? I don't want to. In terms to, of the return uh, profile? We, 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 we will be competing with the best, for sure. We will be competing with the best. Well, the best would be Exxon as well. Of course. And looking at their return profile, the, the yield is about 4%. That would put you in line with the sovereign yield in Saudi Arabia. Now, I'm not sure people would take the additional equity risk for the same price as taking the sovereign risk. I, I would say we will be competing with the best. Looking ahead to what this company will be in the future, you said you'll get refining capacity up to 8 to 10 million barrels a day. When? Uh, over the next decade, we do have a number of... Uh, we just... Uh, uh, closing a deal uh, with 300,000 but uh, J JV with uh, Petronas in, in Malaysia. We are looking at a number of uh, JVs in China currently uh, for uh, uh, two, uh, two JVs right now we are considering in China uh, and we are considering others. We are looking at uh, a JV in India significant JV in India. We're looking at uh, also a JV in uh, Indonesia, uh, Chili Chab refinery there. So we are uh, we're looking at our uh, uh, refinery in the US. We're looking at a lot of the either uh, expanding what we have or getting into new JVs for growth. Not many people would be aware that there is a huge downstream presence for Saudi Aramco in the United States of America, in Motiva. Can you tell us a little bit about that and what the ambitions are for that? Yeah, we do have the biggest uh, refinery in the US, uh, in Port Arthur, Motiva. We own it fully, and uh, we are looking at uh, uh, expanding uh, and integrating it more with petrochemicals, and hopefully uh, we will have some announcement during uh, the visit of His Royal Highness. The Crown Prince. So we can expect the Crown Prince to, to give us some numbers on what the future might hold for that particular business? Hopefully you will hear when, uh, during the visit, uh, some uh, plans, and uh, Ramco will announce some plans with regard to Mativa. I mean, of course, it's out of your control to how much you can produce, but it's in your control to, to where some of that production actually goes. It's tapered off to the United States quite significantly. Is that a permanent loss? of access to, to U.S. markets in the production of crude supply to the United States? Or is that something you think you can get back? No, I think the uh, U.S. is a very important market. That's why, as I said, we have the biggest refinery in the U.S. and we're looking at expanding our presence in the U.S. So it will continue to be an important uh, market. But we need to take into consideration what happened in the U.S. There is uh, additional supply from shale oil the amount of imports is reducing because of the additional supply within uh, the U.S. As a company, we meet the call on our, uh, for our customer in terms of nominations, whatever they ask for. We have good customers in the U.S., good customer base, and we continue to yeah. meet uh, nominations, call on Saudi Aramco. As I said, the U.S. will continue and remain to be an important market. For many people, though, they look at the production in the United States as yeah. Saudi Arabia have backed off. The production has just been filled from elsewhere, which raises the question as to whether you would be able to get back into this market to meet eventual yeah. demand or whether actually domestically the supply story would just meet that demand. But if you notice, till, uh, as I say, there is a significant increase in the U.S. production. Y yes. So when there is a significant increase in the U.S. production, uh, that uh, amount of import will go from somewhere. That 
increase in internal production, it means a reduction from current suppliers to the U.S. So we got our share and we'll continue, as I said, monitor the case and whenever there is a need for higher demand uh, in the U.S., we'll continue to avail it. To the, this is an important market for us. That's why uh, we are looking at expanding our footprint. You know, we have a refinery that has more than 600,000 barrels of capacity here, and we're looking at expanding it. So it shows the interest to uh, maintain our presence in the U.S. and grow that uh, presence. Do you see any supply gaps opening up in the next several years in the United States? Are you as optimistic on this shale story as many other people are? I think the shale will continue to grow, uh, not linear growth that others are predicting because uh, our analysis show that you know when you will continue to focus on the sweet spots of, for shale oil, that will give you additional supply. But don't forget shale oil, the decline is 70 percent in the first year, almost 70 percent. So you will need to uh, continually add more capitals to maintain uh, the supply and grow that supply from within uh, the U.S. Uh, ultimately, with time, you will run out of sweet spots and you need to uh, venture to other less uh, uh, promising uh, in terms of uh, prospects within the shale oil. That will increase the capital and also increase the decline. Uh, ultimately, it will reach a point where the growth will plateau and uh, that will take a couple of years, of course. And then uh, there will be uh, a decline because, as I said, that decline would require huge capital just to maintain uh, the supply. And would you be willing to invest in upstream capacity now to meet that supply gap in the future? Well, uh, as I said, for us, our strategy in, when it comes to our uh, upstream will continue to strengthen our upstream and will continue to be the most reliable supplier of crude oil. Our strategy is also to reduce our carbon emission. That's why you'll find out we are working in a lot of technologies to turn CO2 to useful products like polyurethane, carbon capture and sequestrations, working with car manufacturer to avail engine that produce less carbon, more efficient, and better fuel formulation for less emissions. So there is a lot of working to reduce our carbon footprint while expanding and, and growing our uh, upstream and talking about the gas in particular. So uh, oil will continue to meet the call on Saudi Aramco. Uh, the growth that we are seeing mainly in gas, uh, in, in, in refining and petrochemicals, because we are trying to integrate and add value to our, uh, for each barrel that we produce. I want to wrap up with two questions about the future, the short term future and the much longer term. In the short term, when this IPO roadshow gets underway in the future, what do you think investors are going to be most surprised about when they really get the transparency of the company you run that they want? As I said, we are uh, excited about sharing a lot of information about the company. They will be, as I said, there is a lot of information about uh, the technology and how much technology helps Saudi Aramco. You see, uh, the carbon emissions is not related only to uh, uh, the type of crude or the quality of reservoirs. That's why we produce more. It's the amount of technology that we are using also to capitalize on the pressure downhole to push the barrels to the surface and reduce water and gas ingress into the oil. So all of these technologies help us to reduce our carbon emissions. The investors, when they see the data, they will not see the lowest cost only. Leadership in safety, leadership in environment, leadership in technology. And cost. And cost, of course, that goes without saying. But also uh, in terms of carbon intensity. So uh, our barrel, when it comes to carbon emissions, is, is one of the best. In 2030, the Crown Prince has his big vision for 2030. I'm trying to work out still what Saudi Aramco looks like in 2030. What is Saudi Aramco? In 2030, I think it will be you know more integrated. Uh, you, you will, right now today, the upstream and downstream is not balanced. When I talk about downstream, I'm talking about refining and petrochemicals and loops and all of that. You will see more integrations. You will see more of our barrels 
instead of going to uh, refineries, we'll be going to petrochemicals. So I think you heard about our investment lately with SAVIC on 45% conversion. We're working on technologies to convert 70% of the barrel to petrochemical because there is much more growth into the petrochemical. So you'll see more integration, more shifting downstream, and adding more value to the barrel we produce through that integration into refining petrochemicals, marketing and loops, of course. Can we expect downstream capacity to, to meet upstream capacity at some point in the future? It, if it doesn't meet it, it will be very close. 8 to 10 with a maximum sustained capacity of 12 million, that's very close to our capacity. But we have to do the best things based on, you know, uh, What's, uh, what are the markets that are available for us for investment? What is the strategic fit for each investment that we are looking at in different countries? All of these we need to take into consideration uh, and how can we add value for each barrel we produce. I mean, Nasser, the CEO of Saudi Aramco, it's been great to catch up with you today. Thank you Thank very you. much. Thank you, John. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate Thank you, it. sir. Thank you.